Howdy there. This is a a short episode of the HVAC School podcast, and this short episode is some common temperature measurement mistakes. Very common, actually. See it all the time. But before we get into it, I want to thank our sponsors, and our sponsors are Carrier and Carrier.com. We are both CFAD dealers and ductless dealers, the new Carrier ductless program. We're part of that at Kalos, and we appreciate working with Carrier. You can find out more at Carrier.com. Also, NAVAC at NAVACglobal.com. You can also find all the NAVAC products by going to TrueTechTools.com and typing in NAVAC. You can use the Get Schooled code for those great products to get a great discount. And also, if you want to join the latest giveaway, we've got a giveaway that's closing very, very soon. In fact, actually, I think it's next couple days, maybe. And you can sign up for that by going to HVACRschool.com forward slash NAVAC. That's HVACRschool.com forward slash NAVAC to have a chance at winning their cordless flaring tool, which is an excellent device, something that we really enjoy using at Kalos. Also, I want to thank Refrigeration Technologies at RefrigeTech.com. They make great products. You can also find all their products at True Tech Tools. We really like Nylog, especially. Nylog is a great, great assembly lubricant. We put that stuff on everything. It's kind of like Frank's hot sauce. We put it on everything. And last but not least, I want to thank Aeroasis. Aeroasis.com forward slash go. That's a really easy URL to remember. You can pause right here and type that in your phone. Aeroasis.com forward slash go. If you're interested in finding out more about how they can use Petri dishes to test before and after for indoor air quality, or if you want the really special deal that we have for personal use, it's a really inexpensive price for trying out their Bipolar or their Nano on your own house, you can go to aeroasis.com forward slash go, fill out the form, ask any questions you have, and those guys will take really good care of you. That's the Bennerts down there in Amarillo, Texas, who make Aeroasis. All right, so let's talk about some common temperature measurement mistakes. I'm going to talk about one of the more common ones. And uh, I was actually just talking to my service manager about this, and he gave a really good example. And that is that he was testing a system. He checked the superheat and subcool and the pressures and everything, and it was all checked out really good, checked out to spec. And the customer was complaining that it just wasn't keeping up. 78 degrees in the house, equipment running. He was starting to think, okay, it's just not quite meeting the expectations of the customer, but it's running fine. And then he puts a air temperature probe in the duct, And it's one of these applications where it's hanging horizontal in a garage. And so there's not much duct for him to get his probe in. And he puts his probe in and he's measuring about a 19 degree delta T dry ball beer temperature split. And he's thinking, okay, this is normal. But then he goes through and he just throws an amp clamp on the heat strips. And the heat strips are actually running. So he's measuring a 19 degree split and the heat strips are actually running. And on the face of it, that sounds crazy. Like, how could that be? But heat strips on a heat pump, which is what this was, it's their small heat strips, just five kilowatt heaters. They go right into the center of the airstream. And so the heat that comes off of those heat strips is going to go right down the center of the duct. And I've tested this so many different ways. This actually comes up a lot when people are trying to do the heat rise calculation using heat strips. They're trying to just run heat strips and calculate CFM of air based on the temperature rise is that it's really difficult to measure the air temperature when you're running heat strips because that hot air tends to go down that center part until it has a real chance to mix. So you've got to go quite a bit of ways down the duct or even to the first register closest to the unit to measure in order to get an accurate reading. So sure enough, he goes down and he measures and then he's only got a 12 degree split. So pretty big difference there. And that obviously ended up being the problem. So You have to really take care when you're working with a system that has heat strips that if you're trying to measure the air temperature with any accuracy, whether with or without the heat strips, you got to make sure that you're measuring either further into the center of the duct, which has its own drawbacks because then you're going to potentially be affected by the radiant heat, which we're going to talk about in a second, or go further down the duct where the air has a chance to mix, you're shielded from the radiant heat of the heat strips, or maybe even that first register closest to the unit, which can be a pain in the butt. I know that, but that's really the best way to do it. The other option is to measure at a couple different points and then take an average. That can also help you. If you measure a few more points, average it out, that's going to give you a better sense of what the actual temperature is. Now, if you're working on a typical fan coil or a heat pump unit with an air handler and you're just running in cool mode and you're not running heat strips and you're not testing it that way, then generally it has enough space to mix because it's gone through the coil, then through the blower, then up through the duct, and now we're going to have a little bit more reliable reading. But the other side to that, which is probably more common for most of you around the country, is you work on gas furnaces with coils on top, either cased or uncased coils. And when you put a probe in the duct above the unit, you're often very close to that coil. And that coil, if it's looking at your probe, that's the way I like to think of it, it's in visual contact with your probe, 
it's going to absorb heat from your probe via radiant heat transfer. And so a lot of people think that that only applies to hot objects, like there's radiant heat transfer from the sun, but it also works the other way. So when there's an object that's lower temperature, like your evaporator coil is, it's going to absorb heat from your probe via radiant heat transfer. And that's actually one reason why probes are often shiny, because it helps reduce that a little bit, but you're still going to get some of that radiant heat transfer, and so you're going to tend to read a lower temperature if it's exposed to that coil. The other thing that impacts it is because now you're measuring much more closely to that coil, the air doesn't have a chance to mix before you measure. So you're much more prone to get an incorrect reading on a furnace with a coil on top than you are with a fan coil where the coil is below the blower and so it has a little bit more chance to kind of mix together before it gets to the point where you measure. And that's an important thing to realize and that's where you can either average, take a couple different measurements, you can go a little further down the duct if you have access. A lot of times if you're working in a crawl space or a basement or something like that, you have a little bit more access to the duct, even in an attic. But if you're working in a garage or a closet or something like that where the duct goes up and then kind of disappears, you may need to go to that first closest register in order to get a more accurate supplier temperature reading. So that's something to watch for. It's difficult to know, obviously, exactly how much of an effect it's having. So you have to kind of just have a good sense of whether you're very close to the coil or whether you've got some space. In general, you'd like to read at least a couple feet away from the top of the unit and even more than that if you can. It's even better if you can get a turn in there so that way it's got a little more chance to mix before it hits your probe. Another thing to think about is this comes up also when you're measuring temperatures outside. So when you're measuring outdoor temperature, I see guys do this all the time. They'll say it's 95 degrees outside. Well, they're measuring by the condenser with their probe exposed to the sun. And so you want to get that probe into the shade away from the discharge air of the condenser or a dryer vent or anything else. You want it to be in the shade, not affected by anything else in order to measure that outdoor temperature when you're going to calculate your appropriate condensing temperature over an ambient you're going to maybe use a superheat calculator or something, you want to make sure that you're measuring that in the shade. It's very important that that's where you get it so that you're not affected by those radiant gains. And even sometimes if you're in the shade, if you're in the shade but it's affected by something else that's hot, like as an example, we work on a lot of air conditioners that are very near gas pool heaters. And so maybe that gas pool heater is working to heat up the spa and that pool heater shell is hot or warm and now my probe is exposed to that, that can even be a radiant heat gain. So you want to think about what surfaces are looking at the probe. And the same thing is obviously true in thermostats. One of the first things you should learn in school, <laughs> literally one of the first things is that the thermostat shouldn't be located in a place that's affected by sunlight or a door that could open or other hot surfaces. So it's not just a matter of that thermostat not having sunlight shine on it. It's also is that thermostat in a location where it's going to be exposed or its sensor is going to be exposed or the mass of the thermostat is going to be exposed to another surface that's going to be a significantly different temperature than the room temperature, the actual air temperature in the room, because that will either drive up in the case of hotter surfaces being exposed to it or drive down the temperature if it's colder surfaces being exposed to that thermostat because that's radiant heat transfer. Radiant heat can be transferred through space without even needing to heat the air in between. The example I always use is put your hands in front of your face when you're looking at a campfire. You can feel that just shielding your face from that campfire cools down your face, and that's just shielding your face from that radiant heat. And now instead, that radiant heat impacts your hands that's doing the shielding. And that's the same concept with whenever we're trying to measure temperature in an accurate way, we have to shield from radiant heat, which means we got to think about that in duct, out of duct, on a thermostat, outside, you got to think about whether or not radiant heat's going to be affected. You have to think about air mixing, especially when it just came through a coil or off of a burner of a furnace or whatever. You want that air to have a chance to mix. Like I said, the worst cases that you're going to see this are going to be on cases where you have electric heat strips because they tend to sit right in the center of that airstream. They tend to really have some huge variations depending on where you measure. You got to be really careful with that, especially if you're doing that temperature-rise calculation for airflow, it's much more difficult than it would seem on paper. We have a calculator in the new app for HVAC School for Android and iOS that you can download now that allows you to do that calculation. But word to the wise, it is not as easy as it sounds on paper. You got to take multiple samples in most cases, and you really got to leave that unit off for a long time. So that coil has a chance to dry out before you attempt to do the temperature rise calculation. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's fine. Don't worry about it. But those of you who know what I'm saying, this accurate use of temperature measuring equipment, thermometers, is extremely critical when it comes to getting an accurate result when you're doing these more detailed type of measurements.
The final thing I want to mention is something that we don't think about a lot, which is that when we're using line temperature clamps, we often don't think about how clean the copper is. And this has always been true, whether you're using a K-type thermocouple or a thermistor, proper contact to that copper is very important. But now there's a new product on the market, Fieldpiece makes it, it's called the Rapid Rail System, and it actually uses the copper as part of the conductor to make the circuit. And it just helps it measure a little more quickly, but it's much more sensitive to the copper needing to be clean. So if you've got a dirty suction line, dirty liquid line, and you're trying to measure with that new technology, that new Fieldpiece clamps, you're going to measure incorrect readings. And so it becomes more critical that you keep that copper really clean, although it always was. If you had a bunch of crap on your copper and you're trying to use a clamp on it, it's not going to measure as accurately than if you're on the bare copper. So keeping a little bit of emery cloth or maybe a steel bristle brush or a brass brush or something like that in your go bag is going to be a good thing to have so that way you can clean it up when you take that measurement and get a little more accurate reading. Because when you're measuring superheat or subcool on critically charged systems, even a degree of difference can make a big difference in the operation of the system. So you want to make sure that you're getting those accurately. So those are the three. Think about radiant heat, think about air mixing, and think about cleanliness of surfaces when you are measuring temperature. And by golly, if you're still using one of those laser infrared thermometers to measure temperatures, you really need to understand how that works. That's not what this podcast is about. I've written articles about it. If you're using that day in and day out to measure delta Ts and things, you might want to rethink that or at least make sure that you've done your research on how that works. And we'll talk about that again another time. All right. Hopefully that helps. We will talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast.